Love. Welcome. Ambassador Adlan Rose <coughs> traveled to the retreat in Cape Town and also ate one third of a plate of food like everybody else. And he excelled as a diplomat and won the hearts of all the people present, mashallah. So welcome, Ambassador Adlan Rose. Yeah, mashallah. And so, our first comment is that we do not recognize it as a revolution. We say it's an uprising. Our second comment is that it is possible for us to engage in political analysis of what occurred. The conduct of the regimes, the oppression which was visited upon the Egyptian people and the Tunisian people, it is possible for us to engage in economic analysis of what were the causes of the Egyptian people being driven into abject poverty and destitution. And that, of course, is the subject of riba. But if I spend half an hour on riba tonight, my wife is going to be very angry with me. <laughs> but we say that Political analysis and economic analysis is inadequate. Secular scholarship cannot go beyond political and economic analysis. But Islamic scholarship can go beyond it. What's the difference between the two? Let's take a minute before we proceed to the lecture. I told them in Cape Town in the retreat, that Al-Azhar University woke up one morning, in fact I was introducing Ambassador Adlan Rose's talk at the retreat. Al-Azhar University woke up one morning and looked out into the mist and saw something strange and mysterious, something looking frightening and dangerous. So Al-Azhar University, which is Islam's premier institution of Islamic learning, learning which is based on the sacred, sacred knowledge, rubbed its eyes and then opened its eyes again and looked, it was still there. What's that? It was something called Cairo University. <laughs> and I'm conscious I'm standing in the University of Malaya. And Cairo University presented the mother of all challenges. It was secular knowledge challenging a sacred model of education and knowledge. Ambassador Adlan Rose, in his address at the, at the retreat, spoke about colonialism and the colonial control over the territories. In the process, he had to point out it was not only political control, it was not only political enslavement, it was not only economic enslavement, but it is also the mother of all challenges for the world of knowledge and education. The difference between Islamic perspective here and the secular one is that the Islamic perspective of the Arab uprisings would look not only to the political and economic analysis, but also to something beyond that. A branch of knowledge that is called, it's a big word, don't be uncomfortable, it's called eschatology. Eschatology. In the Quran, Allah speaks of Yawmul Akhir. Al Akhirah. Yawmul Akhir. He speaks of a Sa'a. And in the English language, we call it the end times. And I tell you, secular scholarship, even if it is sitting here in this hall, is very uncomfortable with this subject. Because secular scholarship has a bar preventing it from penetrating the end times. So now let me introduce you to the first verse of the Quran for tonight's talk. It is in Surah Al-Isra. And when I was a student, every time my teacher quoted the Quran, I was there to put it out. So I go back home and check it out. 
I think it is verse number 51 or 49, I think. Surah Al-Isra with the Surah number 17. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who have no faith in Yawm Al-Akhir, in Al-Akhirah, in Al-Sa'ah, in eschatology, in the end times subject. They don't have, you never hear them talking about this subject. No secular scholarship does not do that. And this is what he has to say about them. He says, وَإِذَا كَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ And when you recite this book, the Qur'an, جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ We place between you and those who scoff at eschatology, scoff at the end time, scoff at any reference to al-Masihu al-Dajjal, scoff at belief in the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, scoff about Imam al-Mahdi. You know them. You're familiar with these people. So Allah says about them, جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرَةِ هِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا I put a hijab which is mastur, which is covered. So it's a double hijab. So they can try as much as they want. They can dance as much as they want. Whatever intellectual tune they want to play, they will never be able to penetrate the subject. So they can only give you analysis based on appearances. While Islamic scholarship, if it is blessed by Allah, will be able to penetrate beyond appearances to reach the reality. It is the Quran that delivers that. And tomorrow night, I believe, our topic is precisely this. The Quran and Yawmul Akhirah. The Quran in the end times. How do we approach the Quran that the Quran can teach us the subject of the end times, which is the reality of our subject tonight? That's tomorrow night's lecture. When we look at what is happening in the Arab world today, we see, first of all, that there is a significant difference between the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, and Yemen, and Syria on the one hand, and the one in Libya on the other. Because these were all peaceful uprisings. The people had come out in a popular demonstration of protest. They didn't come out with cruise missiles. No. But in Libya, by some mysterious methodology that I better not talk about tonight, the weapons reached to these, these cities. Large quantities of weapons were already in place. And the entire operation was orchestrated from Washington. And they didn't hide it. Mr. Big himself was sitting comfortably in Washington. And so, if you want to call this a jihad in Libya, I'm afraid I'm going to have to describe it as a Yankee jihad. <laughs> yes, and they deserve, they deserve this description that I am now giving tonight, a Yankee jihad. This does not mean <laughs> that we are writing a blank check, a blank check for the the, the the gentleman who's been ruling over Libya for these last 40 years. No, we're not doing that. Why is it that we had a different scenario in Libya from the rest of the Arab world? I want to suggest to you that it is only an eschatological analysis that will give you the answer. Not a political and not an economic. Mm -hmm. But before we turn to the eschatological analysis, let us enter into the record that Islam, the religion, has zero tolerance 
for oppression.